Now time for question period. Can I ask the member for Nickel Bell? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le Premier ministre. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Refusing to bring in mandatory vaccinations for healthcare workers. He's ignoring the evidence and the best medical advice this province can offer. He's ignoring the clear call from experts. But have no doubt, speakers, the science is clear. These vaccines will save lives. They will protect workers. With zero evidence, the Premier claimed that he, we would see tens of thousands of workers leave the health care system, a claim that his own Minister of Health says was dated. Speaker, unvaccinated staff should not be allowed in our hospital ICU. They should not be allowed to work with sick kids on pediatric wards. Why did Question. the Premier not listen to the expert and bring in mandatory vaccine in Ontario's hospitals? Thank you. I recognize the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Nicobelt for the question. As you know, we have in Ontario one of the highest vaccination rates in the country and in the world, with 88.3 per cent of Ontarians over the age of 12 with at least one dose and 84.7 fully vaccinated. To date, instances of COVID-19 transmission in acute care that might require a mandatory vaccination policy have been incredibly rare occurrences, thankfully, and that's thanks to the comprehensive infection prevention and control policy that are in place. And just this week, we have seen the unintended consequences that a province-wide vaccine mandate for healthcare workers can have by looking at the other jurisdictions that have done so, Quebec and BC. Yesterday afternoon, Quebec announced that they will be pausing their mandatory vaccination policy due to the impact it's having on providing critical yes, services. And British Columbia is postponing surgeries and procedures due to staffing shortages. Organizations here have a flexible policy. They can have a vaccine mandate. That's working for us, and we think Thank that's you. the way to proceed. Thank you. Well, I return to the member from Nickelbell. Thank you, Speaker. The Ontario Hospital Associations, the Medical Associations, the Registered Nurse Association, they are all disappointed with our Premier's decision. The OHA said, and I quote, there's a strong consensus among Ontario hospitals for a provincial policy requiring healthcare workers to be fully vaccinated. They go on to say, the overwhelming numbers of healthcare workers who are fully vaccinated also deserve to feel safe and to deliver patient care in an environment that requires the highest level of protection available against COVID-19. Speaker, the Premier asked for their advice. He got that advice, and that advice is clear. The healthcare sector wants mandatory vaccine in healthcare Question. to keep patients, their family, and staff as safe as possible. Will the Premier agree to change his decision, agree to listen to the overwhelming majority of healthcare experts, Question. and implement mandatory vaccine in Ontario's hospitals? Matt, recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout this pandemic, our highest priority has been the health and safety of all Ontarians, and we will continue to do everything that is necessary to protect our communities and our hospitals. And we've seen from the experience of other Canadian jurisdictions that implementing a province-wide vaccine mandate, mandate for hospital workers can negatively impact patient care especially in northern and rural uh, areas. We're very concerned about that. British Columbia has had to cancel surgeries and diagnostic tests because of the sudden termination of more than 3,000 health care workers after implementing a vaccine mandate. And as I said, Quebec has now abandoned their vaccine mandate because of the significant risk and abrupt loss of thousands of health care workers poses to delivering critical services. It's a complex issue, but when the impact Answer. of potential departure of a significant amount of health care workers is weighed against a small number of outbreaks, we are not prepared to jeopardize the delivery of care to millions of Ontarians. We will continue to monitor the state of our hospitals, and we will do what is necessary to protect all Ontarians. I return to the member for Nickelbelt for the final supplementary. Speaker, this bad decision is a clear example of a Premier not doing his job. Instead of our hospital and healthcare professional having a clear provincial direction, we are stuck with 142 different sets of rules, one from each hospital. Another bad decision in a string of bad decisions, Speaker, like 
the Premier's refusal to bring in paid sick days, which mean that this pandemic can continue to drag on and on. When is the Premier going to start listening to the advice of the Science Table, the Ontario Hospital Association, the Ontario Medical Association, the Ontario Nurses Association, and work to get us out of this pandemic and stop passing the buck? Thank you. I turn to the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Nickel Belt. Throughout this pandemic, we have listened to the science, we've looked at the evidence, and we have been following the advice of our healthcare practitioners and providers, especially especially the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario. And while organizations and settings in Ontario have the ability to put in place additional policies, a province-wide vaccine mandate is not in the best interest of the health and safety of Ontarians at this time, according to the evidence. Nonetheless, we fully support the decisions that many hospitals have already made to implement mandatory vaccine policies on their local circumstances and based on what is happening in their hospital and their area. Organizations themselves are best equipped to understand how a mandatory vaccine policy may affect their workforce. And Answer. as an additional layer of protection, healthcare workers are now uh, able to book their third dose of their vaccine uh, as of Saturday, November 6th. Thank you. I recognize the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. In 2019, over 250,000 people visited food banks in Scarborough, a number which has seen a sharp increase during this pandemic. As of 2018, in my riding of Scarborough Southwest, our poverty rates are higher than the rest of Toronto. 33% of children under 18 and 23% of total population are living in poverty. 27% of all tenants are living in subsidized housing. This is my community where seniors, immigrants, children, working folks are left behind because things are get, becoming more unaffordable. Where people have to make the impossible choice every day between eating their next meal or buying their medication or paying rent. Speaker, my question is, does the Premier recognize that under his government and his low-wage policies, things are getting harder and harder for Ontarians to make ends meet? I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for this question. Of course, ensuring that uh, our government has supported our most vulnerable throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has been a key priority for this government. In fact, last year, Speaker, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services released our new poverty reduction strategy. This five-year strategy will help support Ontario's economic recovery by connecting people experiencing poverty with training, health and other supports to set them on a pathway to jobs jobs and financial stability while helping people keep more of their hard-earned money. As part of Ontario's effort to support children, youth and families through these challenging times, we also provided $8 million in funding for Feed Ontario. Answer. This funding assisted Feed Ontario in producing and distributing pre-packaged hampers to support the great work of food banks throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'll be pleased to speak Thank a little you. bit further in the supplementary. Great. Member for Scarborough Southwest Speaker, for the supplementary. Speaker, a month ago, I joined a community meeting where a community member broke down sharing how difficult it's been for him. And I quote, it's so hard to keep up with affording groceries. I don't even know if I can make, make enough to have my next meal. I wish someone would put me out of my misery. Those were his words, Speaker. Speaker, this government has failed the people of Ontario especially if they have lost their jobs or are on social assistance. People are losing hope because the Premier's bad choices and his low-wage policies are not helping them. Even people with full-time jobs, especially those who are paid minimum wage working long hours, cannot make ends meet. Why hasn't this government made the cost of living a priority for people of Scarborough and across, the, people, across the province? I recognize the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate uh, the question from the uh, member opposite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was proud uh, to join uh, Premier Ford, uh, the Finance Minister, Minister Bethan Falvey, uh, on behalf of our government uh, to announce a minimum wage uh, increase, 760,000 
uh, men and women, these frontline heroes that have served all of our families uh, in all of our communities uh, during this pandemic will be getting uh, bigger paychecks. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, if you are someone uh, earning the general minimum wage, you're going to earn about $1,400 uh, more per year. If you are a liquor server uh, in restaurants, Mr. Speaker, you are getting a pay increase of $5,100 uh, per year. Mr. Speaker, everything we're doing is about bigger paychecks, more workplace protections, and creating more opportunities Answer. for every worker in this province. Here, here. The member from Scarborough Southwest for your final supplementary. Speaker, a senior named Lynette, named Lynette reached out to my office to share her frustration about the increasing cost of living. From dental services to prescription drugs, rent, hydro, water, gas, she's not able to afford the basic necessities from fresh food to phone bills to TTC fare. We have families of four or five people spending decades living in a tiny one-bedroom apartment because it is simply impossible to afford a home. I cannot even begin to tell you about the long wait lists of housing or the high cost of childcare. Speaker, again, my question is, when will the Premier even acknowledge that his policies have made it impossible for people, including seniors like Lynette, to afford the basics in Ontario and do better by the people of this province? Thank you, Speaker. Question. I recognize the Minister of Labour. Thank you uh, again, Mr. Speaker. Look, as I said, uh, Mr. Speaker, everything that Premier Ford and our government is doing is to help people uh, with more take-home pay. Uh, to improve workplace protections uh, for these frontline workers and all workers across the province. But, Mr. Speaker, one thing uh, that I'm proud of is the work we're doing to retrain and upskill and train workers for bigger paychecks uh, in this province. I'm proud, Mr. Speaker, for example, we're spending uh, over a billion dollars uh, in the next several years to get more uh, people into the skilled trades. We know, uh, for example, over the next number of years, we're short 100,000 uh, construction workers. Mr. Speaker, these are damn good jobs that pay six figures with defined pensions and benefits, something that I thought the NDP would support. But, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue uh, helping people, lifting everyone up in this province to ensure they have more take home yes, pay sir. to support themselves, but most importantly, to support their families in all of our communities. Thank you. I recognize the member from Quetinaw. Uh, Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. On um, October uh, 26, the Court of Appeal was told the legal process that led to the permanent uh, injunctions against the, the land at uh, 19, or, uh, 1492 Land Back Lane contained no attempt at reconciliation. This land is part of the Holloman Tract, which was granted to the Six Nations of the Grand River in 18. Uh, 1784 for helping the British during the American Revolution. Speaker, since then, the people of Six Nations of the Grand River have been fighting to retain the land promised to them through treaty. What is the position of this government on finally resolving the land claims Question. involving the Holloman Track? Thank you. I recognize the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to my colleague for, for highlighting another important area. We started the week by talking about uh, important matters in terms of treaties, this being Treaty Week, and so I thank you for that. As you know, and you know, sometimes more can be accomplished by, by me not speaking about things that are within discussion and, and before the courts. Uh, so that's unfortunately the position that we're in, that I, I can't actively engage in that uh, debate here. But uh, ongoing discussion is important. Uh, respectful discussion is important, and I think the, the engagement that we have on all the treaties in Ontario are important, and that we honour and, and that we continue to abide by the, uh, by the spirit of the treaties that they were enter, entered into at the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I return to the member for Quetnong for a supplementary. Uh, I'm not asking the, uh, the, the government to address the matter that's before the courts, but I'm asking to address the province's responsibility to the Haldeman Track Agreement with the Six Nations. Uh, Speaker, uh, land defender Skylar Williams said this, and I quote, injunctions put our nation-to-nation -nation relationship in the hands of men with guns. Courts and, and cops are not up the path towards truth or reconciliation. We may never find justice 
and their system. Our connection is to each other. The land and the water is, the, is what will guide our actions, not courts or cops. Peaceful negotiations uh, cannot happen with the gun on your back. End Question? Quote. Ontario must honour the treaties. When will Ontario stop ignoring the, their treaty responsibilities to the six nation, to six people of six nations? I recognize the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, I, I want to thank you for the question for highlighting a, a really important uh, uh, treaty and, and a really important area for us. I think the, the record of our government is that we are actively engaged in, in discussions of peer-to-peer of, uh, -peer and, and respectful dialogue so that we can reach a consensus, that we can reach a conclusion and, and do it in a, in a peaceful way, do it in a respectful way. Uh, this being Treaty Week, Mr. Speaker, I think it's a, it's a time to, to celebrate the, the coming together and the collaboration that we've had with many treaties uh, over the years and, and the resolution, whether it be with the federal government or by the federal government, uh, but each of us having our own responsibility, respectful dialogue, and uh, continued Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the past 18 months have been some of the most difficult in modern life. The pandemic has and continues to challenge us in ways previously unimaginable. While our province is making tremendous progress, beating back the worst of the Delta-driven fourth wave, families in my community of Oakville, North Burlington, remain concerned about their health, their jobs, and the recovery of the province. Speaker, will the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade advise us on what steps our government is taking to attract investments and create jobs in Ontario's economy. Thank you, and I recognize the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you to the member from Oakville North Burlington for the question. Speaker, throughout the pandemic, our government has never hesitated to invest whatever was necessary to protect the lives and support families and businesses. We have supported local businesses across the province through programs like the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, the Eastern Ontario Development Fund, and the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. And our plan to strengthen the economy, create good jobs, and promote long-term sustainable growth is working, Speaker. Just last month, we were in London to announce our support for Shogun Mayataki's $31.2 million investment in Ontario to build new facilities in order to process their renowned Mayataki mushroom. Now, Speaker, these things Answer. are the size of your head, uh, and they are uh, for the agri-farm and pharmaceutical industries. Speaker, only our Mr. government Washington will say to yes to create the conditions for long-term growth. Thank you. I return to the member for Oakville North Burlington for the supplementary. Speaker, the people of Ontario have rallied together to get through the worst of this unprecedented crisis. And as our province recovers from the global pandemic, we will need to strengthen our industries like natural resources, manufacturing, farming, and food production. Can the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade update this House on what the government is doing to ensure we continue moving forward? with an economic recovery for Ontarians in my community of Oakville, North Burlington, and in every part of the province. Thank you. Our Minister of Economic Development, Job Speaker, Creation and Trade. Our, development, our, our government remains steadfast in our commitment to an economic and fiscal recovery that's fueled by economic growth, not painful tax hikes or spending cuts. And that's why we were so proud to support local businesses like the Newton Group in Guelph. They invested $10 million to install equipment to develop a remarkable prefab building system for the construction market. That's why we were over at Newland Feed for their $16 million investment in Wellington County to expand their production facilities to meet their market demands. And that's why we supported St. Francis Herb Farm in Barry's Bay, where they invested $13 million to add new production of their plant-based medicines. Speaker, these are but a few of the investments our government is making Answer. in local businesses all across the province as we continue to unleash Ontario's economy. Yep. 
recognize the member from York Southwest. No, Parkdale High Park. Parkdale High Park. Parkdale High Park. Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My constituent, Carolyn, is a small business owner who received the small business grant for only one of her two businesses, forcing her to decide which one to keep afloat. Like most owners of hospitality and personal care businesses, she is still financially gutted from the pandemic. Meanwhile, her commercial rent has increased. Carolyn wants to know, will the government let small businesses like hers be forced to shut down, or will the government immediately provide a third round of funding to help businesses recover? Thank you. I recognize the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Thank you, Speaker. I really do want to thank the member from Parkdale High Park and the work that she's doing to support her community. Now, Throughout the Small Business Support Grant, we provided nearly $3 billion in urgent support to over 110,000 small businesses right across our province. This also built on more than $10 billion in urgent relief and support that we provided through the COVID-19 Action Plan. We also expanded other areas where we could support our small businesses, like the Digital Main Street program that allowed them to create and increase their digital presence, and for many of the businesses, it was really a lifeline. In 2021-22, we've increased this up $10 million program, which will help another 14,000 businesses create and get online. We also provided $300 million to help offset those fixed costs, including Answer. property taxes, hydro, natural gas for businesses impacted by public health measures. And I'll speak more in the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, and I return to the member for Parkville High Park for the supplementary. Back to the minister. The rollout of the Ontario Small Business Grants was a disaster. There are small businesses in my riding who were eligible, followed the process, applied on time, and yet are still waiting in limbo. When my office sent an inquiry in to the ministry, we got a response that there are, quote, no longer accepting MPP escalations. Instead, small business owners must call a general hotline, which promises to call them back and never does. Is the minister saying that MPPs can no longer assist our constituents? Isn't that our job? Will the minister provide the promised funding to all small businesses who qualify and apply for the grant so that they can survive the pandemic? Question. Thank you. Return to the parliamentary assistant for small business and red tape reduction. Thank you, Speaker. And once again, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. And we're all here to support our small businesses, Speaker. And as I said earlier, we really have stepped up to make sure that we were there, that our government did uh, support them with, with historic spending to make sure we could help keep them afloat. And through the 2021 budget, we also announced a doubling of the payment of this, something that that member opposite and all the members on the opposite benches chose to not support, Speaker. This is something that they said, don't give the second round of funding. And now they stand here and question the government about the funding that we did give. We ensured to make sure that our government was so supportive. They chose instead to support our government to help our small businesses. They played political games at the worst of the pandemic when they needed us the most. Order. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Health. When this government was seeking a mandate from the people, it railed against, and I quote, the elites. It said and continues to say they are, and I quote, for the people. Well, just last month at a special council meeting of the city of Cambridge, the mayor and local city councillors in my city overruled their citizens and decided that they were going to go ahead with a drug injection site in the Galt downtown core. Before this government lost its courage, it went as far as threatening to use the notwithstanding clause to overrule Toronto City Councillors who opposed a reduction in the number of municipal politicians. If this government is truly for the people, will it dig down deep, find some courage and reject Cambridge City Council's application for a drug injection site against the will of Cambridge citizens? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Cambridge for the question. Uh, as you know, this government uh, has come up with a policy for consumption and treatment sites across the province, and we've had 16 that have been approved so far. 
all of these sites are uh, based on uh, reaction from the community. One of the things they have to do is make sure that they are responding to the community needs. Uh, it's important part uh, that they they are a good neighbour and they they provide the services within that context. So we believe that our consumption and treatment site uh, program is a is a good program for these sites and is enabling the sites to be set up. And the sites are saving lives, and that's the number one priority is to be there to save lives. Thank you. Return to the member for Cambridge for a supplementary. I, I know the government has been uncomfortable with opposition to a drug injection site from local residents in Cambridge since this government has committed to funding over 20 such sites across Ontario. The government stated in its application guide for such sites that community support is essential prior to a municipality applying for approval for a drug injection site. In Cambridge, the higher-ups on City Council conducted a survey and the vast majority rejected either proposed location put forward. So what did Cambridge City Council do? They went against the will of its citizens and picked a location for a drug injection site that wasn't even put forward to the community for consideration or feedback. This is clearly a violation of this provincial government's own rules that state community support must be obtained prior to an application. Will the government do the right thing and follow its own rules and its own application process when Cambridge City Council undemocratically submits its application for a drug injection site against the will of the community? Thank you. A return to the parliamentary assistant for the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government takes opioid use very seriously. It is a very serious issue in the province of Ontario. That's why we've approved the consumption and treatment sites that we have in communities that need them across the province. And these sites, as I said, are saving lives by preventing overdose-related deaths. And most people are very concerned about that. Uh, and they want the, these sites to be available to, uh, to save those lives. Uh, but they also connect people uh, to primary care, to treatment, to rehabilitation, and other their health and social services, and that's the virtues of the model that we have put up. I think it's a, an excellent model. But to be clear, we are still looking at applications, and as part of our government's commitment to, th uh, to put $3.8 billion into mental health and addictions to make sure that the health services, the mental health services, are there for the people Answer. who need them and for people who have addictions, that we have treatment, harm reduction, and everything available that they need so we can minimize the terrible toll that opioids are taking on our society. Thank you. I recognize the member from Stormont, Dundas, Seth Bungary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. It's good to see you in your first question period in the chair. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The Great Lakes are pillars of Ontario's economic, social and cultural lives. The health and vitality of these natural wonders are a crucial part of our economic prosperity and well-being. With that being said, Mr. Speaker, could the minister tell us what investments have been made to protect these natural wonders? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of the Environment. Thank, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry, for that excellent question. He understands the ripple effects that clean lakes do have on our, on our economy, be it tourism, yep. culture, our small businesses, and our restaurant sector. That's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is committed to protecting our air, land, and water, and our, we're continued, uh, our continued support for the Great Lakes via such actions and initiatives like the Ford million that were directly invested into the Great Lakes restoration. This will not only help the cultural vibrancy of our lakes, but help our economy throughout the province. Thank you. Thank you. I return to the member from Stormont, Dundas, Seth Lundary, for a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the parliamentary assistant. Ontarians and the communities who call the Great Lakes home have long called for leadership from previous governments to protect their Great Lakes and waterways. And I agree, Speaker, actions speak, or speak for themselves. And many in my riding are eager, eager to see the government act on this issue, not only for the Great Lakes, but for the communities surrounding them that thrive on them. But it's not our Great Lakes that need attention, Speaker. It's our wetlands, our wastewater, and our greenlands, and more. They're all pieces of the puzzle if we plan to be a government committed to effective climate policy. So, Speaker, through the parliamentary assistant, what is this government's plan to protect our environment? You and I return to the parliamentary system the Minister of Environment. Thank you, Speaker. We have many initiatives underway and more to come in the future. Initiatives such as the ones in my backyard of Lake Simcoe, a four 
$6.25 million of the Muskoka Conservation and Management Initiative. We have new wetland conservation partner programs. We also have $50 million to help municipalities improve their, um, their wastewater and stormwater systems. We're also investing in the Canada-Ontario Great Lakes Agreement and projects surrounding how to keep all of our Great Lakes very clean. But, Speaker, while we create all these economic opportunities around our lake, keep our lakes clean, unfortunately, we have an opposition who uh, failed to mention the Green Lakes at all when they had their plan and uh, took many years to develop their plan. But I am proud to stand with this government who is supporting our Great Lakes for now and future generations. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the member from York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, uh, is for the Premier. The proliferation of the cannabis stores in my community of York Southwestern has been raising concerns from residents and local business owners. These cannabis shops are everywhere, including close to local schools. The NDB had called for a well-regulated cannabis distribution, including control through proven responsible hands of the LCPO. Why is it when it comes to communities and cannabis, this government seems to, seems to have a hands-off Wild West approach? Thank you. I recognize the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of, of being able to launch a brand new entity, a, a brand new system that protects our communities, that protects our children, and is battling the black market, Mr. Speaker. It, it, it is a responsible approach to a market-driven uh, uh, approach. It is different than what was being proposed when we were elected, Mr. Speaker. It's something that is going to let the market decide and at the same time protect our children, protect our communities, and make sure that we are combating that black market. And that is happening as we speak, Mr. Uh, happening as we speak, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm very proud of our so we'll far. To I'll have more to say in the supplementary. I turn to the member from York Southwest for his supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question again is to the uh, is for the premier. Residents in my community and business owners have told me they are losing the character of their neighbourhoods with cannabis shops seemingly everywhere. At the municipal level, business improvement areas and residents have little influence on the location of these cannabis operations. Will this government do the responsible action needed of granting municipalities a stronger voice in location and volume of these cannabis shops? Thank you. I recognize the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to put this in context that this, this was a decision made by the federal Liberal government that we would have cannabis in this province, Mr. Speaker. And we were charged with the responsibility of doing it properly. Mr. Speaker, we focused on three priorities. We want to make sure that our communities are safe, we want to make sure that our children are safe, and we want to make sure that we're dealing with the black market, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing all three of those things. Now, the NDP, like the Liberals, would have a different kind of answer. Their answer is, let's just add more red tape to things, and that will somehow solve the problem. We're laser-focused on our communities, our children, and the black market, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week, we heard the Premier say that one of the reasons for his reversal on raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, albeit three years delayed, was to help people who are seeing their cost of living expenses rise. The Premier admits that the cost of living is going up for Ontarians, yet still leaves the most vulnerable among us out in the cold this winter. The FAO's Q1 expenditure monitoring outlined that $500 million was not spent on children and social services, and $469 million of it was the financial and employment supports, including OW and ODSP. Speaker, will he reverse Question. the cuts made to OW and ODSP for the most vulnerable Ontarians, or will the Premier try to reduce his deficit on the backs of the most vulnerable people in our province? Thank you. Recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. And to be clear, Speaker, when our government took office, we raised ODSP and Ontario Works rates. 
Now, of course, over the past year and a half, Speaker, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our government has been laser-focused on supporting some of our most vulnerable. This has meant that we have invested more than $1 billion through the Social Services Relief Fund and expanded access to temporary emergency assistance for those in financial crisis. Emergency shelters, food banks, charities, nonprofits, and emergency services, which needed more support, have accessed this fund to help cope with growing demand and the extraordinary circumstances faced throughout the pandemic. Ontario Works and ODSP clients continue yes, to have access to the government's discretionary benefits program to assist with one-time exceptional expenses related to COVID-19. And, Speaker, in the supplemental, I'll speak to our efforts to reform and revitalize these programs as well. And the member from Scarborough, Guildwood. Speaker, back to the Premier. Here's what you actually did. In 2018, September, there was a planned increase of 3% to OW and ODSP. You cut that increase to 1.5%. Will you reverse your cuts to the most vulnerable people in this province, acknowledging, as you have said, that cost of living has Order. increased? Speaker, my constituents have reached out to me and they have, are pleading for help. A woman gave us a call. She's been waiting 10 months after applying for ODSP, and she says that she is afraid that she's gonna lose her home. She is afraid that she will be forced to move into a shelter. During the pandemic, Ontario government Question. has been appalling to people on OW and ODSP. A one to $200 one-time increase that they had to jump through hoops to get is not enough. Will you reverse your cuts to the ODSP adequacy you. in your fall economic statement? Return to the parliamentary system for community, children and social services. Thank you, Speaker. You know, our government understands that Ontario Works and the ODSP program are critical to helping those who need it most. The system has been facing challenges for years after being neglected by the previous Liberal government, and the COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated those challenges. That's why our government has taken action through our reform and revitalization initiative to work with our municipal partners, to work with our stakeholders in our community and develop a shared vision for social assistance for the future. The focus of this vision is on the people we serve and how we can connect them to supports that respond to their unique needs and the barriers they face. This vision will ensure that frontline Answer. workers have more time to focus on connecting clients with supports like job readiness Order. programs, housing, childcare, skills training, and mental health services. Thank Speaker, you. We're going to continue this important Thank you. I recognize the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. I understand that uh, next week is Crime Prevention Week 2021, an annual event held the first full week of November in partnership with the Associ Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police. I know it is an opportunity to celebrate the successful partnerships Ontario's dedicated police have with local community organizations to prevent crime and strengthen community safety. Perth County is one of the safest places in Ontario thanks to the hard work of community leaders and our local police. Crime prevention is an integral part of what our police services do each and every day to protect us and our families. Speaker, through you to the Minister, uh, could she tell us about Crime Prevention Week 2021 and why it is important to Ontarians? Great question. Great question. Thank you. I recognize the Parliamentary Assistant to the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perth Wellington for that question. And I want to begin by acknowledging the sacrifices and bravery of our police services across Ontario. I was disturbed to hear that just last week here in Toronto, shots were fired at a Toronto police station. Some commented how little the media coverage there was on this event, and I believe that might be because, as a society, we sometimes take for granted the bravery of our police services. I know that both sides of this House uh, members have not forgotten the sacrifices made by our police officers. Mr. Speaker, I encourage everyone in Ontario not to take for granted the bravery and sacrifices that our officers keep our communities safe today, every day, and especially next week as we look ahead into Crime Prevention Week.
Thank you. I recognize the member from Perth Wellington for a supplementary. Uh, speaker, through you, I want to thank the member for that response. I know that crime prevention is an integral part of what our police services do each and every day to protect us and our families. We know uh, that crime prevention and community safety does not rest solely on the shoulders of our police services. This year's crime prevention theme is Safer Communities, Stronger Ontario, and it speaks to our shared responsibility. Can the Minister of the Solicitor General tell the uh, House what investments, uh, what investments our government has made in Perth Wellington uh, policing to ensure communities stay safe, like the ones I live in? Thank you. Thank you. I return to the Parliament the Assistant to the Solicitor General. Well, thank you again for the member from Perth Wellington for that question. Community safety is a top priority, not just for those who work and support in the justice system, but to all Ontario families. We have been strengthening our justice system from top to bottom. Our innovations are guided by three goals. Keep communities safe, hold offenders accountable, and deliver justice to the people of Ontario. Speaker, as we head into Crime Prevention Week, I am pleased to tell the member from and the people of Perth Wellington that our government has invested over $2 million since coming to office to ensure that Perth Wellington remains one of the safest places to live in Ontario. Thank you. I recognize the member from St. Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The optometry job action has entered its third month, and children, seniors, and people with complex eye care needs in Toronto, St. Paul's, my community, and across Ontario are suffering. I heard from a constituent whose child desperately needs a new prescription. Without it, she's suffering migraines, dizziness, and comes home crying each day. At this point, she's willing to pay out of pocket for an appointment, but that's not an option here. This has left many with the last resort of leaving the province to receive this vital service. This is no longer solely a health care issue, it's an economic one, as people leave the province moving their money into other jurisdictions to boost their recovery without other options. My question is to the Premier. For a government that claims to speak dollars and cents, is this question. enough now for you to get a fair deal in the hands of optometrists and get them caring for their patients in need as we know they want to in Ontario? Thank, Thank you. you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from St. Paul's for the question. As I mentioned before, I myself suffer from migraines, and I think it's terrible that this young lady is suffering from migraines, and she should have an appointment. So I encourage uh, her and her mother to reach out to the College of Optometrists. There are optometrists providing services in Ontario, and it is frankly a professional obligation of all optometrists to ensure that their patients do not suffer any harm or any deterioration in their condition or suffer at all, frankly. As I've said before, we're extremely disappointed that the optometrists have done this, have walked away from the negotiations. It's very difficult to negotiate if nobody is there at the table. They chose the mediator, they refused to meet the mediator's conditions, and they will not come back to the table. We have done everything possible to lay the groundwork for a deal with the optometrists. We have put up front a payment of $39 million. We've offered 8.4% increase. We've offered ongoing negotiations. We are ready, willing, and able to negotiate with the optometrists. I encourage them all to come back to the table now. Thank you. I return to the member from Toronto St. Paul's for a supplementary. Speaker, the government has known about these negotiations for over a year and decided to do nothing. Let's just put that on the table first. My question is back to the Premier. The government has said over and over that it is optometrists who are not coming to the table. Doug Doug Darabi, the Senior Director of Government Relations with the Ontario Association of Op Optometrists, has confirmed that he has not heard from this Conservative government since August 29th, almost two months ago. This was after the government presented a deal that could only be described as a joke after years of negotiating with this government and, quite frankly, the previous Liberals. A day of meetings through mediators and lawyers costs each side approximately $15,000. While this government may be comfortable spending taxpayer money on poor, unfair negotiations, the OAO question. does not have these means. My question is to the Premier. When can the Ontario Association of Optometrists expect a fair, realistic deal that will get them back to their patients they so desperately Thank want you. to see here in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from St. Paul's for the question. Of course, the mediator left the parties with a standing invitation to resume mediation at any time. All we're waiting for is for them to come back 
to the table, the ministry has accepted the mediator's conditions. They have the, me the ministry has communicated its continued willingness to return I'm to sorry, mediation, and Glenn the Gary will come ministry to order. is ready, willing, and able to do just that. That's what we're there for. Since day one, we've done nothing but try to get to an agreement with the optometrist. But they're playing using hardball tactics, frankly, and using vulnerable patients uh, as part of their negotiating strategy. I would encourage them to come back to the table. We are prepared to do everything possible Through the to chair, deal, please. including review the overhead costs, which they say are an issue, but we need to see uh, the material. So we need to get them back to the table. That's where a deal will be made. Thank you. I recognize the member from Cambridge. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On the question of whether workers should be losing their jobs for not taking a COVID-19 vaccine or for not wanting to disclose their status, this government has been on both sides of the issue, seemingly on a weekly basis. Members of this government have previously said publicly and in this legislature that the government encourages employers in healthcare and other sectors to implement mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policies for employment. Then the government voted against a private member's bill to stop people from losing their jobs. Then they flip-flopped and followed my lead to vote against Bill 12, which would have made such mandatory policies the law. My question then, will the government clarify are they in favour of employers firing employees as a result of implementing new mandatory COVID-19 vaccine policies, yes or no? Thank you. I recognise the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, during this entire pandemic, uh, the health and well-being uh, of all of the people of Ontario has been uh, our government's uh, top priority. We're proud of the uh, vaccination rates uh, in this province. We're leading uh, the world, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, great news. This means that businesses uh, are going to stay open as we continue uh, to battle this pandemic as long as uh, we continue uh, going in the right direction. But Mr. Speaker, uh, everything we've done is to uh, ensure that the health and safety of everyone's protected. That's why we move forward with um, robust inspection plans of workplaces. We put out uh, more than 200 uh, guidance documents to help businesses adapt uh, when this pandemic uh, hit. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, every single day ensuring the health and well-being of the people uh, is protected and we continue to uh, grow our economy as we come out of this pandemic. Thank you. I return to the member from Cambridge for the supplementary. Well, Speaker, just this week the government seemingly changed its position again. After previously advocating for employers and healthcare to implement COVID-19 vaccination policies and terminate thousands who do not comply, the government said mandatory COVID-19 vaccination would not be required for healthcare employees. Despite the flip-flop, the government continues to allow employers and healthcare to fire thousands over this issue. And because of the government's fear-mongering for 18 months and continued use of emergency measures, employers in every other industry are firing people as well. The Minister of Labour has said there is a labour shortage. My question is, if there is a labour shortage, why does the government think it's okay if public sector and private sector employers fire Ontarians as a result of mandatory COVID-19 vaccine policies if such a policy is not required in health care? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Labour. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, um, we're going to continue protecting the health and well-being uh, of all of the people uh, of this province. We have come so far uh, together, Mr. Speaker, uh, employers, uh, government, uh, labour, workers uh, working together, and that's why uh, we're doing much better than most jurisdictions, not only in Canada, but around the world. So let's continue working together. Uh, let's continue to encourage uh, the people out there that haven't been vaccinated to get vaccinated. That's why we're beating uh, COVID-19, and we're going to continue uh, to grow our economy, uh, create jobs, fill those labour shortages, and defeat COVID-19 once and for all. Thank you. I recognize the member from St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I met with Philomena Scarfone that recalls the protests by families with children who have autism during the previous Liberal government. She cannot believe it is worse now. Being forced to pay out of pocket for the therapy they could afford only four hours a week until they got funding. Unlike almost 50,000 children in Ontario, Philomena was accepted to Ontario Autism Program. Her words, night and day, the difference the funding made with an additional eight hours a week of therapy, but this government makes them wait for the second round with no timelines. 14 weeks she has been watching her son regress without therapy. Premier, you blew up the existing program. 
When will your government Question. invest in comp comp comprehensive need-based programs so fa families like Philomena can get the services they need right now? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite uh, raising Philomena's story. Of course, our government wants to make sure that we are supporting all family with children with autism. And to respond directly to her question on investment, Speaker, our government is the government that has invested the most in the Ontario Autism Program in Ontario's history, <laughs> doubling the budget from $300 million to $600 million. We also brought together a group of experts, family members, folks with lived experience, clinicians, brought together to develop a community made uh, a program designed by the community for the community. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, we're incredibly proud of the work of our Ontario Autism Panel, and we're hard at work implementing that new program. We have foundational services that are now offered to Answer. families with children with autism. We have early years uh, caregiver mediated services services offered to families with children with autism. We have 600 kids moved into new core services. Thank you. Lots of work that is being done so far. You know, as a member from St. Catharines for the supplementary. Care. I'd like to see this government invest in the 50,000 children that have autism that have been waiting for them. Tammy Petal is another Niagara mother that has been sitting for months waiting for a response for the second round of the one-time funding. Since, since, like the past Liberal government, you have not removed age caps. Tammy is worried his son will age out of the program before she gets the next round of funding. Families of children with autism are are more worried than ever after the government admitted they wouldn't have a fully functioning Ontario Autism Program until 2022. People in Niagara are tired of hearing election promises to fix problems in 2024 or cynical policy reversals for a question grab while we sit have big gaps for families in Ontario today. Premier, will you fix this program and finally be transparent on wait lists and timelines for families like Tammy's? Thank you. I return to the parliamentary assistant for the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And as I mentioned previously, our government is hard at work implementing this program designed by the community for the community with a record $600 million budget. Speaker, when we talk about wait lists, when we look at the previous government, the financial accountability officer found that between 2012 and 2018, the autism services wait list grew by a staggering 47.8% each year. Wow. Under the previous government, that wait list was stagnated, the program was underfunded and folks Member on the wait Mount list did not order, receive please. any supports. Now under this government, the program is much better funded, $600 million. We have a new program that is being rolled out as we speak, and folks on the wait list are finally receiving support. Over 39,000 families Answer. receiving Member of some Mount level will of come support to order, more please. than at any other time in Ontario's history. Speaker, there is a lot of work yet to be done. I will be the first to Thank acknowledge you. this. But we are are hard at work implementing this program. Thank you. Going to be I recognize the member from Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier announced that the government won't require hospital workers to get vaccinated. Now, many hospitals have already taken upon themselves to require this of their employees. And why? Because it's very reasonable to expect that healthcare workers are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. At the Ottawa Hospital, at the Ottawa Hospital, Mr. Speaker, they have a vaccination rate of over 99 percent. At the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, the rate is 99.7 percent. And at UHN here in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, the vaccination rate is 98 percent. The largest hospitals in the province have proven that vaccination requirements uh, can work. Now, a few weeks ago, Nick Kavoulis, the Premier's right-hand man, attacked hospitals, saying that their CEOs are only playing politics instead of trying to protect their staff and their patients. So does the Premier agree that the presidents of UHN, CHEO, and the Ottawa Hospital are playing politics? Is this the reason he won't mandate vaccines for health care workers? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as you know, we've had one of the most successful vaccination campaigns here uh, in, in Canada in, and in the world, frankly, with over 88% of people with one dose and 84.7% of people with 
two doses. And to date, instances of COVID-19 transmissions, as I've said before, in acute care have been extremely rare. So we value the input that we received from hospital and health system partners, and we fully support the decisions that many hospitals have made to implement vaccine policies based on their local circumstances. But as we've seen in other jurisdictions, a system-wide mandate is not the right approach at this time. We have heard from multiple CEOs, as well as numerous organizations around the province, who have described strong concern about mandatory vaccination policies in hospitals, particularly Answer. in northern, remote, and rural areas, where hospitals have uh, more extenuating circumstances and need their health care workers. So we want to do what's right for all Ontarians, allow hospitals Thank you. to make flexible decisions. Thank you. Thank you, member from Orleans for his supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental uh, is also for the Premier. 85% uh, of hospital, uh, hospitals responded saying that they would support a vaccine uh, mandate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, the Premier has said that tens of thousands of health care workers would lose their jobs with a health care vaccine mandate. When asked, the Minister of Health had no backup to this statement. Now, hospitals already require proof of vaccination or immunity for 17 conditions, including measles, rubella, varicella, and tuberculosis. And to my knowledge, this has never caused a shortfall in staffing. Now, this isn't the first time that the Premier has said one thing and the healthcare officials has said the other, leaving the Minister of Health to hold the bag. So will the Minister provide to this legislature and to the people of Ontario the proof that 10,000 healthcare workers will lose their jobs? Thank you. Uh, assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Just this week, we have seen the unintended consequences of province-wide vaccine mandates uh, across, uh, across provinces like BC and Alberta for their health care workers. Uh, yesterday afternoon, Quebec announced that they'll be pausing mandatory vaccine policies due to the impact it's having on providing critical services to patients. British Columbia is postponing surgeries and procedures due to staffing shortages. Ontario is a very large province, and we think that the flexible approach is the right way to go. A mandatory vaccine policy for health care workers would exacerbate already existing challenges in rural, northern, and remote hospitals, and any further departures uh, at those hospitals would have significant negative impacts. And We had several uh, CEOs from hospitals writing letters to that effect. Uh, they said that this would cause um, uh, them to lose and have to close entire departments, for example, because they have one person there who has specialized nursing Answer. skills. One size does not fit all is another thing that they suggested. We know that they're in a fragile state. They need to have those health care workers working. We're leaving it up to the hospitals who know best. From Sudbury. Here, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Brianne from Sudbury has multiple mental health diagnoses. Speaker. She relies on her service dog, Felix, to function as an individual and to remain self-sufficient. Brianne receives about $1,100 a month from ODSP, and that barely covers her rent and her bills. Obviously, the ODSP guide dog benefit of $84 a month would really help her. However, Brianne's been repeatedly denied because ODSP requires recipients to prove that their dog is trained in an accredited training facility. Interestingly, Speaker, according to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, an animal is, is a service animal if the animal can be readily identified as one that is being used by a person for reasons related to the person's disability, including where the animal is confirmed as such by a letter from a qualified regulated health professional. And so Brianne provided a doctor question to ODSP and continues to be denied. If the government cares so much about cutting red tape, will it take the well-being of Ontarians like Brianne seriously and remove the overly strict rules for accessing the guide dog benefit? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. And I, I appreciate the question from the member opposite and, and for raising uh, Brienne's situation. Uh, I'm eager to learn more about the guide dog program in ODSP and would be pleased to speak to the member afterwards about Brienne's case and see if something can be done. Uh, in the meantime, Speaker, what I can say is, is that our government uh, is committed to ensuring that we uh, go forward with the renewal and revitalization 
implementation of the Ontario Works and ODSP program. Uh, we're hard at work consulting with our municipal partners, uh, with stakeholders, and with many people in the community about how we can improve these systems. And, Speaker, we also look forward to the federal government fulfilling their campaign commitment to create the Canada Disability Benefit to increase the Answer. level of supports for those receiving the Ontario Disability Support Program funding to more closely align with the Canadian recovery benefit levels. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I return to the member from Sudbury for a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It would cost thousands of dollars to get Felix the accreditation that would make the $84 ODSP guide dog benefit available. And frankly, that's impossible because people on ODSP like Brianne, they don't even have an extra $10, let alone thousands. What's, more, what's worse, Speaker, is when Brianne contacted the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, she was met with rudeness and a wholesale dismissal of Felix's vital role in helping her live in dignity with her disabilities. As a reminder, Brianne relies on Felix to remain self-sufficient. He assists her with medication reminders, medication retrieval, behavior interruption, anxiety alerts, dizziness alerts, alerts to sit down and reminders to eat. Felix is Brianne's lifeline speaker. When will this government acknowledge Brianne's humanity by apologizing for the ill treatment of Brianne and removing the overly strict rules for accessing the guide dog benefit? Thank you. I return to the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I, I appreciate the member opposite raising Brianne's case. It's an important case and one with the, which I, I'm sure all of us in this chamber want to make sure folks like Brianne support they need. Again, Speaker, this is part of the reason why our government is undertaking efforts to reform and revitalize our Ontario Works and ODSP programs after years of neglect under the previous government. We are conducting consultations as we speak with multiple partners, including our municipalities and others in the social assistance sphere. And our new vision is going to really focus on the people we serve and how to best connect them with the supports that respond to their unique needs, Speaker, uh, because we know that there are multiple unique needs Answer. within folks who are accessing these supports. So we're going to continue to move forward with these consultations, and we're going to work hard to make sure that these programs are there for those that need it most. Thank you. That concludes the time for question period for today.